right. So good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining me on the talk about Hitman Go. Uh, at this point, I would like to remind you to turn your cell phones on silent mode. And also, please don't forget to fill out the speaker evaluation at the end uh, to tell GDC how awesome or how bad this talk was, I guess. So uh, this talk is going to be a postmortem on the hit game Hitman Go, but at the same time, I'm going to try and document the creative process a little bit that went into uh, the making of this game. Uh, a little bit of an introduction about myself. Uh, I'm Daniel. I'm a game director with Square Enix Montreal. Uh, before that, I used to work as a designer for both Square and EA. Um, and at the same time, I'm kind of an independent developer on the side. In my spare time, uh, I ship these three uh, games by myself. They're iOS games, if you want to check them out. And so to tell the story about Hitman Go, I think we have to look at three things. We have to look at the circumstances uh, that allowed this project to happen. We have to look at the idea that initially started off the project, and we have to look at a process that refined this idea uh, into the game that is now downloadable on the App Store. And to be honest with you, with the circumstances, this is not really the story that I can tell. Uh, this is uh, the story of management, I guess, of studio management that allowed this project to happen, and I was not part of that at that point, but I still want to give you a little bit of an uh, introduction, a little bit of an overview to get you uh, the ne necessary information. And so the story starts here with Square Enix in 2012, uh, the summer, at uh, the winter of 2011-2012. Uh, Square Enix decided to start a new studio in Montreal, and someone had this brilliant idea to turn up uh, side down the E from the Square Enix logo and make an M out of it. I uh, always thought that was pretty brilliant. And so it was the winter of 2011-2012, uh, um, and there was uh, a new studio to be started, and for that, three people from IO Interactive, uh, Mess, Karsten, and Rasmus, who used to work on Hitman games and who had also worked on Kane and Lynch, they came, they relocated to Montreal to start this new studio um, and hire people. Uh, and I was lucky enough to be one of the first hires, and within a year or so, I guess, we had grown to around 40 people. Yeah, you can see this is cold Montreal in the winter, that's what it looks like. And so our mandate was to make a AAA Hitman game for consoles. Uh, this was in 2012, so this was still when current generation consoles weren't announced, uh, so this was a very exciting moment. Uh, I was working on this as a designer. Um, but as you know, plans, they don't always turn out as you expect them to. And so after about a year of development of this game, our project was canceled. Uh, and furthermore, um, Square Enix decided to turn our studio from a AAA development studio into a mobile game development studio. And as you might expect, this is quite a drastic change, and this kind of shakes up things quite a bit. But I'm pretty happy to say that uh, management did a very good job at kind of transitioning from AAA into the mobile space. Um, there was a lot of changes, as you might expect. Some people lost their jobs. Uh, a lot of them actually just left uh, because they didn't want to make mobile games. But at the same time, again, I think this transition was as smooth as you can possibly make it with these circumstances. And at the same time, I think this was a pretty exciting moment for everybody because getting to start working on something new is always exciting. And management realized that, and they started what they called uh, an incubation moment. So. They allowed everybody in the team, everybody in the studio to come up with ideas for mobile games within the Square Enix uh, brands. And we started off with Hitman. And they called this the incubation. And basically, everybody could participate and make their own games. Um, and so the mandate was to come up with uh, an idea for a mobile Hitman game. Really, this was the top level kind of idea. And there was not many constraints around it, right? So we were almost. Uh, given carte blanche on this one, we could come up with our own ideas to whatever we thought was uh, good uh, to make this, uh, this, this game. As I said before, not many constraints other than it has to be mobile and it has to be a Hitman game. And as you might expect, in these kind of situations, we're always kind of inclined to think outside the box and come up with crazy things um, and be really creative. Um, but at the same time, I have to say that I think there was a sense of false optimism amongst us in that studio, even though we were very excited about making and tackling this new, uh, this new platform, we believed that we were the, pro the pros, right? We were around 40 people of AAA developers. Uh, we thought we knew it all, and that mobile was some sort of dumbed-down version of uh, what we would be doing, um, and this could not be very hard. And so we thought we are going to be shipping a game within six months uh, of the initial pitch. Uh, yeah, and so incubation began. 
And I guess my experience as an independent developer also brought me to this point. Um, I, I'm, I really like to work with uh, strong constraints on projects. I find it very hard to start off with a blank uh, piece of paper. And so I was looking for constraints. And again, I think independent games do this very well. They're very aware of the, the kind of the limitations that they have, uh, be it uh, resources or creative uh, constraints. And I think one great example for that uh, is, are the game jams where uh, a lot of games are actually created out of one single theme or a constraint by themselves. But these constraints can be very arbitrary, right? We would not want to make a Hitman game based on the color blue, for example, right? This could be a game jam thing, but for Hitman, it wouldn't make that much sense. And so I guess I was looking for more meaningful uh, constraints and constraints that were related to the mandate. And so in research for this talk and kind of trying to see if this is something that's also applied outside of video games, I came across a very interesting quote by Charles Eames, uh, who was, uh, as most of you know, uh, one of the very most important uh, industrial designers of the 20th century. Together with his wife, uh, Ray, uh, they were probably best known for a series of uh, furniture that has become truly iconic today. And so Charles Eames, in 1972, when asked about, I think it was a Q&A or an interview, when asked about if there's uh, constraints to the design process, he says, Design depends largely on constraints. And so this was in 1972. Please note how I skillfully constrained Mr. Eames' right eye in the letter P there. That's pretty meta. So he says, design depends largely on constraints. And furthermore, here's one of the few effective keys to the design problem. The ability of the designer to recognize as many of the constraints as possible. His willingness and enthusiasm for working with these constraints the constraints of price, of size, of strength, balance, of surface, of time, etc. And then he says, each problem has its own peculiar list. And I thought that was pretty great because even though I didn't know about this at the time as uh, working on the Hitman uh, mobile games, I thought this was pretty close to the actual mindset that we were in at the time. And so again, he talks about price, size, strength, surface, balance, time, etc. And we can imagine uh, him talking about furniture or industrial design and maybe even about this chair here, a uh, uh, dining chair uh, that's uh, beautiful, beautiful furniture. But the question is, is this really that far away? Uh, is this really that different, making a chair, considering all these constraints, from making a game, or in our case, uh, making a Hitman game on mobile platforms? And obviously, as indicated by Charles Eames, a lot of these constraints depend really on the product that you make. And I think, in this case, size, strength, balance and surface, all these kind of material properties that don't really make sense when we talk about games, but we can substitute them, we can come up with other things. And I think price and time, I think we can keep them, maybe like consumer-facing things such as how much is the game going to cost, how long is the game going to be playable, like what's the playtime of the game. But then more importantly, we can, using this model, we can add different constraints, we can add probably the most important constraint is the brand, right? We're working with a brand that is very established, that has gone through many iterations um, that have come out on different platforms before, and in a genre that comes attached to it. Um, a very important constraint, obviously, the platform that we're going to make a mobile game after all, an audience that has expectations towards what we're building. And production constraints, very important. We were a studio of AAA developers ready to ship a game within six months and obviously other things such as business models. So I guess this list can really go on and on, but this is kind of just laying out the, the key important things that you want to consider. And so I guess to illustrate this idea a little bit better, um, we can take this chair and instead of having this beautiful DCW chair here, we can come up and think about different chairs that don't really do that this well. And so we can think about a chair that doesn't have a surface to sit on, for example, which seems silly, but it might be very pleasing to look at, right? If it's well done, it might be very beautiful. And another good uh, thing about this would be that it would probably be cheaper than building a regular chair because we would need less material. But at the same time, it would have very low usability, right? We could not sit on. And maybe as a product of art, this might be interesting. If I was an artist, I could build this chair. But as a designer, I don't think this would fit any of the needs that uh, this product would have. And so the same thing, going back to Hitman, we can come up with some very quick ideas. For example, we could make a Hitman Endless Runner. It would probably work pretty well on the platform, on mobile platforms, but it would greatly conflict with uh, the brand identity. And to be honest, it would also be kind of aiming for the wrong audience. And maybe another example could be if we made a port kind of thing where we used like a third-person point of view uh, with virtual joysticks uh, on mobile. 
this would probably come pretty close to the, ex the original experience that people know from Hitman, but it would have very low usability and I guess also would be kind of the wrong platform because people that want to play these games, I guess they play them on consoles. And so kind of just laying out these constraints here, um, you note that I put uh, four of them in black. Um, I think depending on uh, how you work or what you focus on, you can really emphasize certain things and also depending on the product that you're building. But for us, I think the main important constraints really were platform, brand, audience, and production. Uh, I didn't put business model in black there because right from the beginning, it was uh, clear that we're going to make a premium product. And so we didn't have to really work with that um, during the development. And so the question here is how can we use these constraints to come up with a great idea and a great product? Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think we can because what we're looking at is a pure top-down model. Um, this is a pure analytic and strategic and also very rational model. I think this is pretty, pretty interesting to look at it that way, but uh, this really doesn't lead to any ideas, at least in, in my case. I don't think that led to any ideas. And what we're looking at is more like uh, a set of tools uh, that allow us to evaluate uh, the creative developments. And as you probably expect, uh, the very contrary approach to this would be a bottom-up approach, where we're looking at a more an experimental and random, and also maybe personal and intuitive kind of way of building things that has kind of the idea to become the raw material of what we're working with. And so you've probably heard this before, and you've probably seen GDC talks about, or any other talks about this kind of top-down and bottom-up approach, which is very popular in many different fields, not just game design. But it's really this idea of top-down evaluation and bottom-up creation. And there's many different ways of putting it, top-down, converging thinking versus bottom-up diverging uh, and making. But the way I like to call it is being smart and being stupid. And so this doesn't mean like smart and stupid in a sense that you have to be dumb and smart, but more smart and stupid in the sense that you have to have this high-level approach where you have to consider as many things as possible and being stupid and kind of reckless sometimes to come up with ideas that seem impossible or seem out of, out of the uh, beaten path. And I think Diesel did a very cool um, campaign at some point. They had this uh, kind of photographs of people doing weird things and they always had these taglines kind of building on that saying, smart critiques, stupid creates, um, or this one, stupid might fail, smart doesn't even try. And so, kind of building on that, we needed an idea for a game. And for that, I decided to be completely stupid and bottom up. And at the time, I was uh, talking to my friend and colleague, Antoine, who became the technical director of the game. I told him, listen, I got this all figured out. I know how mobile games are made. There's only two types of mobile games that need to be made. It's only two types, very simple. There is games that have a very short individual session. So, Games like Temple Run that are uh, in real time, but failing at Temple Run doesn't really matter because you can just replay. Uh, and it's really this overall, this big level goal of grinding coins of the meta game that makes it important. So you can play this in between two bus stops, and even if you get interrupted, it doesn't really matter so much because every session is kind of replaceable with another one. And on the other hand, there's turn-based games like Triple Town, um, turn-based games that obviously wait for the user to uh, interact with it. And so we can put them down, pick them back up easily, and we don't get interrupted for anything. And since I didn't feel like making a kind of fast-paced uh, game, and I think Hitman is more like a strategic and smart game in a sense, I think turn-based was a great inspiration. And so I said, let's make a turn-based Hitman game. And this means uh, this is probably looking pretty stupid. Uh, there's no kind of rational thought behind this. Um, and also looking at it today, believing that there's only two types of mobile games is a pretty silly idea, but I think at the point, uh, at the time we were building this, this was enough of an inspiration, kind of initial spark to get started on something. So we said turn-based simplified Hitman. That was going to look like The Sims. Top-down, uh, 3D, lots of characters, lots of details, fully animated, because why not? And so we had to be smart. Uh, we were, uh, as I said, we were working in this incubation moment. We had to convince our colleagues and then later down the line the GL board uh, about making this game. Uh, and so we came up with this strategy of saying we want to make a game, a Hitman game, that's basically based on three things. We want to base it off making a highly accessible game, so a game that you can pick up and play without knowing anything about the previous experiences, uh, the previous Hitman games. But at the same time, we want to make a deep game, a game that has uh, the full Hitman experience and that really starts off simple but gets more complicated and more interesting as you go. And a game that has very high production value because we are Square Enix and people have expectations towards what we build. 
And that worked pretty well. Uh, people really liked the idea at the studio, and then later we were allowed to go to Greenlight with it, and uh, within a short amount of time, actually, we managed to go into development of the game. And so we entered this kind of process. And uh, I guess even before that, uh, we did this kind of round of prototypes. So there was four people, and during two weeks, we built this prototype, actually iterating a lot, building a lot of different prototypes. But it's this one prototype that really uh, led everything. And for that, again, taking a very bottom-up and stupid approach, coming up with game mechanics was what we tried to do. And so having worked about, uh, about a year, I guess, um, on big AAA Hitman game, um, we identified these five things that were essential to the Hitman uh, gameplay uh, experience. And you may say this is pretty dumbed down and stupid again, but again, I think this is just to prove the point that something seemingly silly can spark an idea and interest into something that you then later can refine. So uh, what we kind of dissected, what we distilled from the Hitman experience was that there's five things. There's Agent 47, there's a target I have to assassinate, there's uh, enemies that can try and stop me from getting to my target. There's an environment that I can be in or that my, my enemies can be in. And there's tools that I can use. So this could be weapons, this could be simple things like uh, patrol paths and so forth. And because we had this kind of uh, box full of uh, these kind of board game pieces around at the office, we thought it would be a great idea to kind of use that and to rapidly prototype ideas before we even went into coding anything. And so, inspired by The Sims, we printed out these kind of architectural visualizations of apartments, these renderings, and I remember drawing like little dots with lines on top of it, um, and then starting to move around these kind of wooden pieces around, and hoping that we would come up or stumble upon a great idea for a game design. And that didn't work. Uh, and I think, uh, looking back, I think that was mainly because of one reason, and it was, the reason for it was uh, this, very, this very piece. And if you look at it, it might not be obvious, but when you think about stealth games, one very important thing about stealth games is the notion of being seen or being hidden. So in this case, Hitman is hiding behind the corner there and two characters can't see him. But if you look at our board game piece, this guy has no direction. So what we realized after a while is that we had to give these pieces a uh, a facing direction, basically. We didn't add googly eyes like I did on this one, but I remember putting some uh, some paper pieces on top of it to kind of start playing with that uh, notion of direction. And that was a pretty simple learning, but I think it greatly helped us to come up with a game design. And because this is kind of standard stealth game um, material, we started off with using vision cones, right? Um, I remember uh, Dishonor came out around uh, about the time when we shipped, when we started working on this game, and they had this really cool like 3D visualization of uh, view cones. And so obviously, I guess this and many other games influenced us into starting to work with these things. And we thought that was pretty great, and that we had found a pretty good game design for our, for our project. But obviously, it wasn't the case. Um, especially like uh, in, a, in, a, in a scenario like this, if we expect the blue uh, character to turn to the right, it becomes very hard for the player to, to know uh, which one of these kind of spots is going to be hidden and which one of these is going to be detected. So um, unless we get measuring tape out or we start to do some crazy calculations, we can't really know. And this is something we really didn't want. Uh, we really wanted to not have in our game. We wanted it to be like deterministic for people to really understand what's going on and to really learn from uh, the mechanics. Uh, and I guess in this case, A would not be seen, and B would be kind of in between. So again, it would be too complicated. And so we simplified it, and we came to this conclusion that just aligning the pawns on the grid, so basically on the nodes and the lines that go outside of it, would be a great idea. And we were pretty happy with it, and we thought we had found a great design for our game. But obviously, this is not the end of the story, because as soon as we started playing around with more complicated and more interesting AI, like this guy here that actually uh, ended up being in the game, as we shipped, um, the guy that walks back and forth in a straight line um, seems fairly straightforward, especially in this case. I guess we can imagine the blue guy going up and down on this axis there. But what if there's a more complicated case like this one? Um, do we expect the blue guy, after moving forward, to expect him to move left and right, left or right, or maybe even go back? Um, and I think even though we could have come up with some sort of rule and programmed that rule, a mechanic, a kind of a hidden logic, uh, we wanted to be visible for the user, right? We could have said, like, if there's a certain angle that has to be satisfied or if there has to be some sort of a, a flow, right? We could always say a character turns right if he can't go forward. But we didn't want to do this. We wanted to be as simple and straightforward as possible because 
again, looking at it from a top uh, kind of top-down view, considering platform and audience, we're looking at small screens and we're looking at uh, people who have possibly never played complicated games before. We uh, went with this more simplified approach and said, just straighten it out. And then, I guess, at the end, um, coming up with this very simple uh, and distilled way of uh, creating the mechanics for the game. And we thought that was pretty great. And spoiler alert, I guess if you've played the game, this is pretty close to what uh, the game design ended up being. And even though you might say that this is uh, very simple and almost a bit bland, I think uh, working on this uh, so intensely and actually simplifying it and building it down so much helped us building this core that actually uh, held up up until throughout the, the, actually throughout the whole production of the game. And so this was really the, the most basic building block that we used to build it. And from there we could extrapolate and we could come up with all these cool mechanics that existed in stealth games and in Hitman games and we could then fuel back, we could fuel them back into our experience. And so we added distractions, we added civilians, uh, social stealth, like hiding in a crowd, trespassing, disguises, multiple player pawns, uh, weapons, hacking, and so on. But obviously a lot of these didn't work out. Again, throughout the iteration, uh, trial and error, I guess, uh, prototyping many things, we found out that a lot of these things actually didn't work uh, from a brand perspective or were too complicated or just not feasible or just out of scope for the project that we had. But we added new ones and we did cycle kind of a couple of times. And I guess this is how the set of mechanics that you play today in Hitman Go came to happen. And so again, four guys working two weeks. I guess this core was really built within two weeks on one prototype, and then later we extrapolated from that. There's only one elephant in the room, which was The Sims. Uh, we had promised to make a game that was beautifully animated and fully 3D and everything, but we came to realize that uh, we had to be smarter about it uh, in terms of production. If we had six months to build this game and we had a, already kind of a cool design, we would never be able to make and ship this game within the time constraints that were established. And so looking at the material that we were playing with to kind of prototype and come up with the idea, we thought that this would be a great idea to kind of you know, simplify also in terms of uh, scope. And we used this board game uh, aesthetic uh, to kind of uh, yeah, come up with a better scope for the game. And this was great because we didn't need animations. We could work with static environments. And there was no SFX needed. Um, and at the same time, this kind of uh, just opened up a lot of new ideas. Again, very bottom-up. Uh, we came up with this diorama and scale model uh, vision that just was very related to the, uh, to the board games. And so we went into kind of figuring out what art direction could be. Um, again, pretending to be very stupid and very bottom-up, uh, looking at these scale models, and I think, uh, yeah, I think when looking at these, it is very tempting to just go crazy and say, uh, we want to build these beautifully modeled and beautifully lush uh, environments uh, with a lot of characters. And obviously the first thing you see if you Google these kind of images is uh, a lot of these kind of train sets uh, that I guess grown men build in their apartments and then uh, forbid their, ch uh, their kids to touch them. And I think that was cool, right? It was a great inspiration, but at the same time, again, being smart, looking at it from a brand perspective, it didn't exactly work. Um, even though there was some potential in it, I think uh, it still felt a little bit too nerdy and a bit too obscure for what we're trying to build. And so working with uh, Rasmus, who was the old art director on the AAA game, who had experience uh, working at I.O. and then also with the people uh, still at I.O., I think we managed to kind of get to know the brand much better and really distill down the essence of what Hitman means and what Hitman is. And there's a couple of things that really struck with us. So there's this kind of notion of globetrotting, Hitman traveling around the world uh, to these kind of exotic locations and luxurious mansions that he has to go and take out this uh, evil people that he has to ex assassinate. Um, and then there's things like sterile environments, like even though these have these people have these huge mansions, some of them are pretty empty and it's kind of boring, uh, as you expect from, from rich people's places. And there's this very interesting uh, notion of voyeurism in, in stealth games in general. So if you're navigating an environment and you're uh, not seen, right, that allows you to overhear and eavesdrop on conversations of people and NPCs that don't expect you to do so. And I think if you played stealth games before, again, this is a very big, big thing. I think especially in Hitman, they use this to 
tell these kind of weird and funny stories. Every once in a while, you overhear something. Um, so there's this story in, in Absolution. There's this moment where you hear a guy on the phone talking about his doctor and getting a, a note that he is not ill or he's not sick. Uh, and a minute later, you throw him out of the window. So there's this kind of weird, uh, funny uh, notion, notation of voyeurism. Um, and also this kind of rational, cold kind of atmosphere to, uh, to assassinating people, I guess, in general. And on top of that, this uh, really understated and slick uh, feel that Hitman games have. And we really thought that we need to capture this better instead of just building a train set or a train model environment and really get to know what Hitman was. And here's, I guess, the four inspirations that we then used to uh, really come uh, closer to this brand identity. And the first one was architectural models. And so instead of just looking at scale models and these kind of little figurines, uh, we really like the aesthetic of architectural models because it's more about uh, a global and uh, a more approximate kind of way of building something. And it's more about materials. It's more about uh, shapes, uh, much more than uh, just details and little things. And if you see an architectural model, maybe once in a while there's a little detail, there's a figurine, but it's mostly there just to indicate scale and it's not there to tell a story. Um, and then there's the voyeuristic nature of, of, of these kind of stealth games that I thought still could be portrayed pretty well with the, with the scale models. If you look at these kind of dioramas, you always see these freeze frames, uh, freeze frame uh, scenarios of people talking, of people arguing, or people just enjoying themselves. And so you could almost like see how you could uh, interpret that as watching people doing things and kind of watching on them. And then, obviously, the rational cold uh, thing that we kind of lent from, the, from chess and, and board games in general, very calculated, uh, just moving pawns on the checkboard like, like you would in, in Hitman. It's basically playing uh, puppeteering and engineering, I guess, in situations around. And then, last but not least, the luxurious and sterile uh, that we borrowed from the blog Rich Kids of Instagram. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a pretty great Tumblr. It's basically a curating site. Uh, my friend Eric, who was a narrative designer in the old AAA days, had got me onto this, and uh, it's, it's truly brilliant. You should check it out. It's basically kids from very rich backgrounds taking pictures, and this website curates them and shows their daily lives. And it's pretty impressive because even though it's very... Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's luxurious lifestyle and it's everything you can possibly imagine. But at the same time, there's this kind of bland and sterile look to it um, because these places are huge. They show their huge houses, but they're always kind of empty. It's always the same kind of uh, goods. It's always the same cars. It's always the same purses and so forth. So it's really worth checking out. And so having that, uh, we really felt like we had a really solid base. But again, making that happen was not just a matter of art direction, but it was actually uh, a matter of producing levels and producing level art. And so uh, again, just to emphasize this kind of two-tiered approach of being bottom-up and being top-down at the same time, uh, we were greatly inspired by these two main references, which were architectural models and uh, scale, scale models, uh, dioramas, and we kind of identified a couple of cool things, the physicality of, uh, of things, right? How are things built? Is it made out of wood? Is it made out of cardboard? And how could we portray these material properties uh, in the game? Then there's this idea of variety, because everything is handmade. We expect things to not be entirely perfect, right? Especially if you look at uh, scale models, uh, there's a lot of this variety going on, because everything is basically put on by, by a person. And there's this kind of imperfection, something really interesting, artifacts. If you think about dioramas, um, especially like things like uh, paint being scratched off a little bit through the production of the, of the diorama itself, or maybe a little bit of glue that sticks out underneath a, a grass surface and so forth. Uh, and in general, just adding a lot of detail, we thought that would be the right way to go to really portray this, uh, this view and this vision of uh, this kind of physical environment. But again, looking at it from a high-level perspective and considering production, this was still very much out of scope. And so we proposed a very different system. Um, and I guess this was one of the early sketches. I did uh, just modeled this quickly for a prototype. But the idea was to build the entire game out of, out of these 4 by 4 meter cubes, uh, or blocks, I guess, with different heights. And as you can see, there's different pieces for pool. There's pieces for uh, roads, for house, for uh, uh, grass, and so forth. And this seemed pretty wacky at the beginning, but it actually ended up being the exact uh, 
pipeline that we did for the game. Um, and so if you've played the game, you might recognize some of these places. So we built entire sets for tennis courts, the greenhouse, uh, the pool, uh, the mansion, and so forth. And also, if you've played the game, you'll notice that we had these different locations. So we had different boxes of environments. And for every of these boxes, we built actually a set of pieces. So it's pretty much like Lego bricks, actually. You could just snap them together and play around with them. And then on top of that, uh, we had little pieces, little detail pieces that we could then add uh, to kind of break up the rhythm and break up this kind of pattern, uh, like behavior of the modules. And I thought that was pretty great um, because we could run level art and design in parallel, right? We were really fast with this because as I was building the levels in, in Unity with this editor that we had, uh, the level artist could basically model the blocks and then I could play around without having too much dependency on each other. And it also greatly helped us creating this kind of unified look um, that kind of, I think, is always very hard to achieve in games in general, making something that looks like it's only made by one person or by one uh, uh, general idea that kind of brings everything together. And that kind of obeying this very strict system helped us greatly to achieve that. And even though it is kind of hard to work with, I think also, again, constraint on a very low level, it uh, applied these very interesting constraints that I guess were very inspiring also for us to come up with different locations, different sets, different environments, and so forth. And so this is, uh, I guess, a couple of screenshots to show you how this actually worked in an applied sense. Um, so this is the screenshot from the editor, Bare Bones. I guess we had this really cool tool that the programmers built where we could just place out these little circles and connect them with lines. And then on top of that, uh, we would place the pawns, I guess the spawners for the pawns and the spawners for the tools, like the distraction you see here. And then obviously the extraction point where Hitman has to go to. And then the next step would be take all of these pieces and kind of play with it and arrange them a little bit and start coming up with a cool environment. Obviously doing a lot of iterations to this, uh, considering the different environments that were before and the levels before and after, but really starting to play Lego with this. And once we were happy with a uh, certain design, uh, we kind of put that closer together, added uh, a little bit more detail, like this wooden frame that came, became pretty uh, iconic to the game, uh, and uh, maybe a bit more detail like the grass hedges there. Uh, and then later on we would add more uh, small detail like the trees um, and the little figurines that would tell kind of the story going on and so forth. And then the last step would be to just light the levels with light map, uh, classic uh, light maps, I guess. And so really this kind of initial model of focusing on physicality, focusing on high variety and then artifacts on a lot of detail everywhere uh, kind of uh, was refined into a model that was more focusing on composition, uh, especially because of the modules, uh, the modular system, you had the chance to be very iterative and to do a lot of different, uh, just trial and error, a lot of different variations on these levels. And so we really got to work with this. Uh, and at the same time, capturing that, uh, that idea from the freeze frame live from scale models and really putting in these characters, trying to tell a little bit of a story, a little bit of an environment. Um, working with cross sections, like you can see there, the pool being cut in half, I think is a very strong kind of image and makes people really uh, think about this as a manufactured object or something that uh, you would have in your, on your coffee table or maybe in a, in a showcase and so forth. And instead of having detail all over the place, we actually decided to be way more selective about it. Uh, and so even though, uh, one thing that's quite interesting, even though a lot of people uh, consider Hitman Go to be a very naturalistic looking game, there's actually only one texture, as far as I remember, that is truly naturalistic, which is this wood uh, piece. Everything else is either untextured or has textures that have nothing to do with the original material that we're trying to emulate. For example, the um, the grass, I think it's a sort of a carpet that just looked really good uh, on the screen and on, on what we're trying to do with it. Um, and this helped us greatly with readability, right? Again, looking at it from the constraints about the platform, we wanted this game to be able to be played on small screens and on, on tablets. And so having high readability was really important for us. And I guess focusing on these things uh, helped us manage to, uh, to create a game that was, that was very readable. And so there's one last anecdote, I guess, before I, uh, I want to wrap things up. Uh, and so a very important thing, I guess, to making AAA games transition into mobile games, which is the story aspect. And this is a pretty tough one, because as you might expect, AAA games focus a lot of story. Uh, mobile games don't do so as much. 
And so again, uh, being very bottom up uh, in this uh, in this field, uh, oops, sorry, uh, we looked at our inspiration again. And again, as I mentioned it before, these kind of little figurines, these stories, like this uh, car that broke down and the guy's trying to explain to a police officer and the boy's doing something in the background. This is just uh, a moment of life and we can totally come up with a story in our head as we watch these. And we were greatly inspired again uh, by this. And at the same time, like I mentioned it, we had these modular systems that were uh, developing pretty quickly. Uh, and we were really inspired to just, you know, play around, bottom up, be very stupid, as I, as I would call it, and come up with cool ideas. And so uh, we created this set of, uh, of pieces, of blocks that were based around uh, road uh, networks. And so you can see here, this is like a suburban kind of uh, environment with a lot of roads, street signs, and these trees growing in between the lanes and so forth. And we thought that would be a really cool test bed for our ideas with stories. So the initial idea was to have these kind of developing stories throughout uh, le multiple levels. Um, and so on this one, we did a test where we wanted to have like a car accident, like this, this guy that's trying to get away and you're following him on a highway and then he crashes and he tries to run away. And at some point in some level, you would actually then get to kill him. Uh, and there's something that was really interesting is that no one really understood that we did a test with this and no one really got the coherence between different levels, right? No one understood there was like a continuous story going on in between levels. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's hard to say why that's the case, uh, but I think it's also just because people are very focused on solving the puzzles much more than just observing the environment and also kind of breaking uh, these kind of abstract pieces uh, apart from each other and not having one continuous experience because you go through loading and level selection every time. It's just, it just didn't allow people to understand these stories. And I guess uh, one great example for this is uh, something that we only refer to as the gas station uh, at Square Enix Montreal, which is kind of this weird thing that everybody fears. Um, and so this was, uh, I guess, our idea to make a, an entire mission. This was supposed to become the first mission of the game, an entire mission about a hit, an assassination that you would have to do around the gas station. Um, and you can see this was not just environment art. We also did uh, game design on it. We had these kind of nodes. And you can even see, like, uh, yeah, obviously it looks a bit different now, but there's, it's pretty close already to the, to the experience we have. And so the idea here was that uh, Hitman had to infiltrate this kind of uh, gas station environment where it was this guy that you had to go and kill. Uh, and there's two things, like for one, Hitman was uh, able to go through the sewers, as you can see there, that was pretty weird. I don't know why we came up with this. And then the other thing was on the top, top right corner, you see this kind of soda machine. We thought that uh, maybe coming up with a story where uh, you would have to follow a guy who would really like soda and he would drink these cans of soda and would leave a trail behind him to kind of explain people why you would follow a, pe a person's kind of like breadcrumbs. Uh, yeah, I don't know why, but this is what we tried to do. And so we had to ask ourselves, is this really Hitman? Um, and especially, I guess, looking at the AAA counterparts, this was not Hitman. As, uh, as in uh, infiltrating these luxurious and exotic places, trying to kill like the, the top evil people in the world, but uh, not doing that. Uh, it was, in our case, it was Hitman on the beach uh, trying to bypass a guy in blue there, uh, but can't do that because there's traffic cones on the road. Um, yeah, this was actually a level <laughs> that we built. And so again, I think looking at it from a high level perspective, even though I think that there's a lot of great development and a very creative kind of atmosphere around this, but looking at it from a high level perspective, it just didn't fit with the brand. And so Rasmus, uh, again, the art director in the AAA days, he made the sketch for us that I think was very important at this point uh, during the development. And he uh, kind of took this idea of these little pieces of levels that we had already built, and he uh, designed a kind of a sketch uh, around what he thought uh, a mission or a hit should look like. And so he did these kind of key moments uh, in this kind of infiltrating and exfiltrating, going through a hit, going through an assassination. So it's this kind of hitman arriving at a gate. Uh, there's probably security there, uh, security there that he has to take out and going through some sort of a courtyard, entering a house, there's a watchdog, and then getting to an office, um, taking out the bad guy, and then leaving again. And this was really, I guess, a cornerstone for us in the development. And also looking at the game today, uh, I think it's cool to see how we actually used this and built the levels around it. So this is the first chapter of the game, a couple of the levels. Uh, and then so in the first one, you can see Hitman arriving uh, to this kind of place, to this mansion, and then going through, sort of, uh, through some sort of a gate. Um, 
bypassing this pool area that we've seen in many screenshots now and then. Uh, just all these kind of classic locations that you've probably seen also in other Hitman games. The tennis court, uh, a little bit of a pool house there on the left, uh, going through a greenhouse with a lot of guards, and then entering a mansion where finally we get to assassinate our targets. So really building up this kind of story and this approach of Hitman that we also know from existing AAA Hitman games. And so I guess these are kind of four anecdotes uh, to explain a little bit this approach, this creative strategy of not being afraid of doing seemingly stupid things, but then again, also don't back off from looking at it from a very rational and kind of high-level angle. And so the game mechanics, the art direction, the story, and the level art, I think they're all great examples of how we use this approach to make uh, Hitman go. Uh, and really, uh, as I said it in the beginning, don't be afraid of uh, being smart and forcing yourself to be stupid every once in a while to just kind of not be afraid uh, of coming up with things that don't seem to be uh, uh, lodging. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, I think this could be really described as keeping a balance between the two modes, right? Um, I think Hitman Go was recognized as a game that did something that was pretty un unorthodox. Uh, a lot of people uh, that saw the game initially, they did not really get what we're trying to do with it. Um, but at the same time, I think really keeping this idea of like the impulsive and almost uh, intuitive kind of way of making games, but looking at it and evaluating it from a top level view, making sure that this, these ideas are not just crazy for their own sake, but they actually make sense within the big picture of the brand, the franchise, the platform, and so forth. And I guess another example that uh, if you're developing games, you're probably very familiar with is uh, switching between these two modes of bottom, bottom up and top down. Um, it's very easy to kind of fall into one of these extremes and just to kind of stay there. Uh, so if we're top down too much, I guess it's, it becomes very easy to just shoot down ideas because they seem too weird or stupid uh, from the get-go. And if we're purely bottom up, I think it becomes very easy to get lost and not see the big picture anymore. And so I guess to uh, wrap up and to kind of come back where I started with this presentation, I think now would be the time to see if I actually if this actually makes any sense. So going back to this idea of this comparison between the, the chair and, and the, the game that we've been building, um, looking at uh, Hitman Go on, on mobile phones and looking at, I guess, our four core uh, constraints that we've established in the beginning. Um, and so looking at production, um, we didn't manage to ship before Christmas 2013 within six months. I think that was uh, just a little bit too ambitious uh, for everybody involved. Uh, but we were pretty close. Uh, we actually managed to finish the initial release in February 2014, and I think still today that this, uh, given the fact that we're a AAA development studio and we had very little experience making mobile games, this was a great achievement. Uh, we managed to stay a small team between 4 and 12 people throughout the course of the development. I think also forcing this kind of dual kind of mode of being top-down and bottom-up uh, is something that really works with small teams uh, that I've experienced, and I think we really capitalized on that. Uh, and as I said before, I was actually the only person who had made mobile games before, so I think it was a great achievement for everybody to do this transition and to make a successful game afterwards. And if we look at the brand, uh, many people actually recognized Hitman Go as a true Hitman game, even though it seemed so weird at the first time, at the first time we showed it and people looked at it. And I think we can also say that it managed to open up, maybe because of that, uh, managed to open up the franchise to new audiences and bring in people that maybe knew about Hitman but had never played a Hitman game and so on. Um, as far as the platform is concerned, uh, we managed to ship on phone and tablets at the same time, even though in the beginning we were actually just aiming for tablets. Uh, this was the mandate, and then we kind of shifted during production. Uh, and we were extremely lucky to get, and very happy also to get, Editor's Choice from Apple and being very much featured by Apple and Google. Uh, so there was a great recognition for us doing something specific for the platform and really working on that. And last but not least, the audience. As far as the audience is concerned, you might expect uh, AAA fans being a very tough crowd, especially if you announce that the next installment of your franchise is going to be on mobile games. And I guess we can look at it this way. When we announced uh, Hitman Go on February 13th in 2014, we just showed a screenshot and a little bit of text. This is what NeoGAF looks like uh, on that day. Uh, so guys saying, what the fuck is this? Uh, Turn-based strategy, Hitman, just kill me now. Um, is this uh, a little too early for April Fools? Uh, is this a fucking joke? 47 deserves better than this. I guess this is a classic. But then, uh, about a month, no, sorry, two months later, when we actually shipped the game and people got their hands on the game and even very, like, vocal people 
same forum, uh, different thread, but after the announcement, uh, after the release, uh, it looked completely different. And I think it's kind of a, a very nice thing to look at today and to see how people actually got time to spend with uh, the game and actually changed their opinion on it. So we can say, uh, going back to the slide, uh, very positive direction, uh, reception by a very broad audience. And we got great reviews and a lot of coverage from press uh, uh, and so forth. And that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Sorry about that. So I guess there's a little bit of time. Sorry, that's very unprofessional. A little bit of time left for uh, actually 15 minutes left. If there's any questions, there's microphones. Uh, if you have questions about the development or maybe the idea of the creative strategy that we applied to it. Hey. hey, first of all, good job on that game. I really loved it. Thank um, you. Were there any, did you set any constraints on the size of the grid that you were using um, and determine how much people were willing to scroll as far as, you know, looking at the level? Yeah, actually, this was a, uh, a big part in developing the levels and the design in general. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's two things. It's basically the size of the level, but also the camera, as you mentioned. Um, and we did a lot of iteration on the camera. Actually, we started off with a very free form, like you could pan around, you could rotate and even zoom in and do a lot of controls. Um, but we felt that it was kind of like not slick enough and it wasn't intuitive enough for people that maybe weren't uh, experienced gamers. And so also in the beginning, we had a lot bigger levels, right? We wanted to, to tell more of an environment, more of a story, but I guess in kind of a compromise between the platform, again, the constraints of the platform, we're looking at that, we decided to make these kind of bite-sized and uh, more uh, smaller levels. And I think even though you might find a couple of odd ones, like there's like probably levels still there that are bigger than the, the average, uh, I think uh, in general, we ended up making these kind of like four by five kind of, that's probably the average of level that we built. Hey. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the design, how you designed the puzzles, like the actual just making them hard logical puzzles to solve? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so we had this editor. I think the, the process was very important because we, we didn't really know much about this. There was not a game that we could base ourselves off. There was not a design that we knew that we could just use and kind of reproduce. Uh, and so uh, I guess in the beginning with, the, with these kind of board game figurines, I think that was kind of the first moment where we saw that there was something cool there. But then I think really the, uh, the, the usability of the editors and the tools that we, uh, that we had helped us greatly in kind of just iterating and making uh, a lot of these puzzles. And uh, I mean, it's safe to say we produced uh, a lot of puzzles that were never used in the game. And we tested also with uh, play tests. Um, and so I'm not sure if there's uh, like a strict logic to making these puzzles. There was a lot of trial error and then evaluating, especially in the beginning, right? But as, as, as development goes on, I think you start to identify these kind of patterns. So there's, uh, if you play the game, there's these kind of recurring patterns of puzzles, like there's this kind of uh, idea of, synchroni uh, of, sy uh, of synchronizing uh, characters. And so this is one thing that we started, that we kind of realized and we started using on uh, on levels going forward, and there's kind of a couple of other different patterns that we kind of emerged from the development that we then use, but there's no like a black magic or a, a secret sauce to this, unfortunately. I don't know who was... Uh, yep. um, I'm curious if there were any discussions about um, the business model and uh, which fitted best with the project or if it just came as a design constraint from the very beginning of, or you had any discussions about Sure. Um, uh, obviously, there were a lot of discussions about this. Uh, even I think 2013, the summer when we started, described this the summer of Candy Crush. Um, everybody was talking about premium at that point, um, and so were we, right? I think that's safe to say. Um, I think there was a couple of things that really got into the that made this decision at the end. There was first of all, there was kind of the, the brand value, right? We knew that people playing Hitman games, they expect like a AAA product that picks up something that they pay for, and thought that might be a better transition to start off with a with a premium product. But also, I think the design that kind of uh, was built for the game it really didn't lend itself for a free to play game, right? And when you look at free to play kind of puzzle games, there's this compulsive nature to it, uh, to many of them. And our game was purely deterministic, so to speak. So our game was purely reproducible. Uh, every level, if you played it once, you can replay it over and over again. It's always the same solution. And so there's just this missing component of randomness and, and, and luck that makes a lot of these free-to-play uh, puzzle games work. Um, 
And so at the end, it was really this kind of evaluation between different business models that made us stick with, I guess, the original plan of making a, a, a premium game. Thanks, Daniel. I loved the end-to-end -end journey you took us on there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you made it sound effortless, and, and I was just wondering if you could share any of those moments where you're really banging your head against the table <laughs> and you just thought, this isn't going to work. No, there was none of that. <laughs> um, no, obviously, I think um, looking at some of these scenarios, especially the, uh, the early days, when I think the story might be the, the, the biggest point. We had very high expectations towards that, and especially having a full uh, studio of AAA developers, a lot of them were actually into this whole storytelling and, and, and making that really visible in a game. Um, and so we had probably too high expectations for that. And I remember being very frustrated about uh, realizing that a lot of people didn't really get this kind of continuity between levels and the story that we're trying to tell with these little figurines going from one point to another. Um, and I think it was hard for us to kind of accept that. But I think at the end of the day, uh, this is what, uh, and, uh, was what helped us to really ship the game and also make uh, the experience that it became today. Hey, so, um, uh, right here. Sorry. <laughs> um, so you, you uh, brought me into the Hitman universe, uh, and because of that, I'm not really familiar with the, uh, with the previous Hitman game sound design. Uh, so I, I wanted to know what were some of the decisions behind the sound design. I know it's kind of minimalistic. There's, a, I think, one theme that you hear, like the Ave Maria theme. Yes. Uh, when you're about to assassinate your target. And I wanted to know why uh, you guys didn't have other themes throughout other levels. What was the decision behind that? So you're, I guess you're talking specifically about music, not just the, okay. Well, and, and the sound effects as mm. well. Um, well, I guess to talk about music, um, we, we tried different things, and I think it became very clear in the beginning that this is a very uh, calculated and a very kind of brainy type of game. And, and when you look at these kind of experiences, uh, you don't want to have music that just distracts you too much and everything. Um, and so we were really sparse with it from the get-go. Um, but we had commissioned music. Actually, there's this kind of soundtrack that plays in the menus and that we also use uh, throughout the levels as a build-up. And that worked pretty well. And then at some point, we were really looking at uh, different ways of bringing more of that Hitman identity into our game and then having this kind of, uh, this kind of composition. Actually, it always works like this. Um, in, a level, in, in, a, in a set of levels, there's always two guys you have to assassinate. And so... Two levels before that, there's a little bit of a, of, a, of a change in music pace, and then the one before that, it really picks up. And then the last one, where you actually get to assassinate, there's this uh, theme, Ave Maria, right, that was used by uh, Schubert, that was used by uh, uh, the IO Interactive uh, when they worked on other Hitman games before. So it really was, for us, was a way to connect with the audience again, and I think a lot of people recognized and really appreciated that. And maybe about sound design, I think... Um, there was this discussion right really early on how literal we wanted to be right we had this kind of uh, board game idea aesthetics and everything so it was very obvious it could have been very obvious just to say oh let's make these sliding pieces uh, moving back and forth uh, but i think uh, james our sound designer had kind of great ideas about how to maybe break that a little bit and so i think it became this very interesting blend between uh, putting sounds on something that you expect, but also I think there's sounds in there that don't make any sense, um, uh, quote-unquote. Uh, for example, like when you throw a distraction, you actually hear a guy being uh, making a sound like this. So I think it is this kind of charming mix uh, of different effects that, uh, that we ended up being really happy with. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. Um, one of the really interesting player constraints in Hitman Go is the fact that you need to make a physical move each turn. You need to move to another spot. I was wondering if that's something that you locked in on really early, or if you did experiments with a weight or something or anything like that. <laughs> this is a, this is a good question because this came up during development all over and over and again, um, and so there was almost like these kind of two camps uh, in our team. So uh, people that believed that there had to be this kind of, uh, I guess, inspired by classic Hitman games, uh, a feature where you had to wait, where you had to be able to wait and kind of just half the situation, you know, go on. Um, and on the other hand, we had the, uh, the, 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 the learning that if you make puzzles, um, you have to make them really tight, you yeah. know. Um, uh, Antoine, uh, actually, I'm a, the technical director, had this really good analogy. It's like building a set of IKEA furniture and then at the end having a screw that's, that's left over, right? It's very an un unsatisfying process, right? And I think making these puzzles very tight so that you... Um, feel constrained again, I guess, in that sense. Um, and 
don't have the option to kind of just make everything go back and forth was was kind of the obvious choice. And I guess especially with the with the game design, if you've played the game, there's this, as I said before, this is kind of synchronous patterns, right? So if I'm on a odd uh, node, then all the enemies that are on even nodes, I can take them out and so forth, uh, and vice versa. And uh, this was pretty much the foundation of the game design. And by having uh, by allowing people to wait on a spot, we basically just would have thrown out uh, this, this design as, as a whole, and so we decided to stick with it. Absolutely. Thank you. Hi, I was just curious about the, um, if you have a comparison profit-wise for a, a mobile game, which you're charging $5 for versus making console games where you're charging $50. Sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question. Do you pretend? Sorry, the mic sounds a little weird. Uh, I, I'm trying. I'm curious. Maybe my phone. Uh, I'm just curious about the profitability of when you're a mobile game versus a console game, where you're charging five dollars for a mobile game versus how much you would charge fifty for a console. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure I can, I'm really the person to talk about that, to be honest. Uh, and also, I think uh, this being a project of like a publicly traded company, I'm not sure I can really disclose any information. Um, again, uh, I'm, I'm, I worked on this AAA product before, but I wasn't really involved in any of the kind of financial background in it, so I guess you would have to uh, ask the people being, uh, uh, I guess, in charge of that to, to get Would you say the production's a lot simpler for a mobile game? Um, I think... Simple is maybe a way you can put it. I think maybe thinking back about the slide I had in the beginning where we said that mobile games are easy to make because they're kind of like a dumbed-down version of AAA games. Um, it, I don't think it is that way. But when you look at, I guess, production constraints and when you look at scope of projects we can, on, on mobile, you can get away, quote-unquote, uh, much easier with like smaller scope games, right? Because that's what people kind of want. Also, in, in many cases, bite-sized uh, experiences. And so... Yeah, I guess uh, you can make uh, cheaper mobile games in general than, than console games. Okay, thank you. Hi, we are running out of time here, so here's sure. the last question. Uh, during the presentation, you talked about, uh, you come up with conclusion that for mobile, there are only two kinds of games that are worth making. One is fast-paced, short-section kind of game, and one is turn-based. And I'm curious, how do you guys come up with that conclusion? Um, I don't know, honestly. That was just a random thought that I had, and I think this is really the idea of, of, uh, of this, this underlying concept of being a bit stupid every once in a while and not being afraid of doing so. Um, I was pretty sure this was an amazing idea, and I was pretty sure this was the way you make mobile games, you make successful mobile games. Obviously, today we know there's a lot of other mobile games that are not uh, falling into either of that category, but um, I think, again, at that point, all we needed was an initial spark, something to actually start working, and I can't tell you where it came from originally, maybe some sort of an article that I read or just a random thought I had, but yeah, I guess that's how it started. Thank you very much.